All right. These Pondo boards are not the greatest surface for running your chisels. But I don't have a decent board right now. I got one on order. I'm going to use my Pondo board. You can use just a cutting board. A, a, one of these poly cart cutting boards. Like I said, mine bowed on me because it was too thin. Get a good, thick cutting board and you're going to be okay. Um, this one was just too thin. I learned, don't go get a Walmart cutting board. Order one that is good and thick. So I've got a one inch thick cutting piece of cutting board material coming. That's what I'm going to use from now on. It's going to take about two weeks to get here because I ordered it from a kitchen a uh, industrial kitchen supplier. Anyway, the, when I designed this tip, I designed it so right here I would be able to go four times with my ch stitching chisel because I have a four tine chisel here. So that's what I'm going to do. You want to make sure, usually on something like this, I will actually angle it in just a little bit. Doesn't have to be a lot, but just a little bit. And don't, my advice is, and you can do what you want to, when you have a tool like this, don't strike it with a steel hammer. You can get something like this that is inexpensive on Amazon. Um, I do not have a link for these in my Amazon store because I hate these things. This one actually keeps coming loose on me. <laughs> but you can get these. I have... This is just picked up at Walmart many years ago. It's just a tent stake hammer. It's not very heavy. It's pretty light, but it does the job. So there's a lot of different options out there. I think that tent stake hammer was like four or five dollars in the camping section at Walmart. So you don't have to spend a million dollars. Don't use a rubber mallet. Rubber mallets aren't going to work. They'll bounce back and too much springy, which is why the Pondo boards don't work real well. But I can use this. I want to watch my tines, not the handle, but the tines of my of my uh, chisel down here. I'm just going to angle that just a little bit. see where they're coming out on the back side. They look pretty good here. Looks like I'll be okay with them. And just hold right next to the tines when you pull it out. Just wiggle it a little bit, pull it out. I don't want to drive my chisel into this hole, but I need to use it to mark where the next hole is going to be. And then I will I like to look onto my chisel so I'm seeing which direction the teeth are aiming. Looks good. Oh, let's see if I can, how many. I think I had this set. So I do a full set here and maybe like, let's see, mark that good. Yep, I think I had it just like that. I think, I think. I think we're in there. think if 
if I start here I can hide my little boo-boo there better. So I think that's what I'm going to do. Because I want to hide my boo-boo. You can kind of see how they're turning out on the back there. They look like the spacing is pretty good. I think my boo boo on the front here is pretty gonna much, pretty much gonna be not very noticeable when it's all said and done. But we'll see. Only one way to know. I'm gonna go ahead and just punch the rest of these holes when I get to the other end. I will show you how I deal with that, getting it just that one hole over. I'll be back. I had all my holes punched. I forgot to turn the camera back on, <laughs> but I just got one hole just over the edge. When I got down to about here, I started kind of ticking off my holes. I kind of used the, the chisel to kind of space them out, and I would see if I was going to let one of them wound up where it was right just before the line. So as I was punching them, as I was spacing them out, I just kind of push it just a light, you know, half a tine up over if it was even half a tine but it was just enough to put that one over the edge instead of behind the edge or behind my line and that was all there was to it put it right where I needed it and now I'm gonna move on to dyeing the leather alright there's a couple of different ways you can go about dyeing a belt like this I like to do it after I have the two pieces glued together and all my holes are punched. That way the dye gets into the holes too. Um, a lot of times, if I'm especially if I'm doing more than one belt, I will dip dye. So if I'm doing, usually if I'm doing one belt, I'm doing two. That way I've got one for the customer and one for stock. A lot of times I'll do them the same size. That way they're just identical belts. Knock them out and they're done. So I'm only doing one. If I'm doing one, I'm just going to dye it whatever colors I decide to grab on. <laughs> Today I'm grabbing black. Uh, I'm going to dye it and I'm just going to cover everything, flip it over uh, after the dye soaks into the leather and then do it again. Two ways that I've done this. Um, on a veg tan like this, you don't have to go over it and deglaze the leather. That's mostly for uh, finished leather. So if it already has a finish on it, you'll want to deglaze it. This has nothing on it. It's pure veg tan. So it really doesn't need it. Um, I'm just going to use straight up. This is a Feebing Black. I put it in these bottles because it's just easier to handle. Because uh, I buy it in quartz and black. I usually get in a gallon. It's just easier to handle in one of these. Uh, so, uh, you can get four ounce bottles of these. You don't have to buy big bottles. You'll want to shake it up a little. Kind of mixes the solids up off the bottom of the jar. And you just gotta, I like to use these daubers. This one's used because why, why change them out all the time? This way I can make better use of them. And it's just pretty simple. Dip your dauber in a dye. I'm make sure you get in the holes. If for some reason the dye is not getting in the holes the way you want, grab a paintbrush.
you can sometimes if you're going to oil your belts this is it's a good time to oil them before you put the dye on because the oil helps the dye soak in a little better but you need to when you oil it you need to let it sit um, I usually will let it sit overnight and the dye you will usually just soak right in or you can just use a little water get it wet and then let it sit for 20 minutes or so and go ahead and apply your dye this is Phoebing's Pro dye so it's they're all alcohol dyes this one just has a uh, uses an oil as a carrier the color's a little splotchy on the black but that's okay it'll even out once there's a uh, finish coat on it which will be either tan coat or resoline if you use tan coat there you can oil over tan coat I will oil this belt you don't necessarily have to but I will oil it <coughs> Uh, both sides after we're done uh, before burnishing probably at the end of after I get stitched that kind of thing pull it through choke up on it so my tag ends my tails are down here right by the bottom loop I know you probably can't see that but that's where we put it we'll just feed out a little extra as we need it it's a long piece goes from I always stitch I pick a point on the tip which I've picked right here and I'll stitch all the way down one side from there all the way down to my last hole here and I'll do the same down the other side so now I'm in my stitching pony and it is at an angle it is not an optical illusion it's at an angle so that a it's comfortable it's at a good height for me to work at from this chair if I'm sitting in my stool it sucks I can't work on this pony um, but it sets the belt so it goes up let me uh, rotate the camera just a little bit so that the belt actually goes up onto the top of the bench here and causes no more problems for me so it just goes up there it gives that end of the belt a little support I can take these other belts and they can actually sit under the other end for a little extra support and then I can just keep going here like nobody's business and once I'm uh, find my groove again I don't even set my needles down I just keep going And you hear me talking about finding a groove you got to get a rhythm going once you find that rhythm you find that uh, doing stuff like this really isn't that hard and while hand sewing something like a belt does take a while It's not all bad. I think I must have done some sanding over here and I got all kinds of dust on the floor. I'm going to have to take a minute and sweep here. My thread keeps dragging into dirt and the, uh, the dust <laughs> and it picks it all up. It's 
So I'll be back in just a minute because I really am going to go sweep this up. <laughs> so I've been looking for a property in town that I can afford either to rent or buy. Enough yammering. Because if I do get into a full time property or move this and spend the amount of money that I'm gonna, I'm gonna be doing this full time. It doesn't bother me one bit. I enjoy it that much. Down to the last couple holes, just like stitching anything else, you want to back stitch a couple holes. So let me get these last two in. I should have timed how long it took to actually stitch this belt. On one side. Now, let's see. You can see where the end of my backing is, and the needle comes just past. That's the way you want it because it'll bind that end. Now we're going to go back. So now we're going back and we got a kind of backward stitch. Got to remember, so the back hole has to go in first. thread goes over the top this time. That's what it was. So we're pulling top and bottom or opposite. It's not a huge change. It's just a little switch. But now the hole's getting pretty full going in there. Now I'm just going to take the one from the front. Two is usually enough. Sometimes some folks go three, some four. I like to go at least two. So I want both snug. And we'll see how well this goes. So I have my threads here. I'm going to cut those off pretty close. I don't I know you won't be able to see this real well. Throw 
Throw that over my shoulder, maybe. That'll kind of do it. Let's see if I can adjust this light a little. I'm going to snip them off pretty close. Leaving maybe about that much sticking up between an eighth and a sixteenth of an inch. And then we'll just, uh, where'd I go? Where'd I go? Where'd I go? There we are. I'll just kind of hit them with the lighter here. and melt those ends down and once we've got a top coat on there you won't even know they're there once they're hammered down you probably won't even notice it and that's really all there is to it there's the bottom stitch there i gotta stitch the other side yet the front try to get that so you can see it decent there's the back Still have to hammer it down, but it all looks really good. Time to get after the other side. So I've got the belt all stitched up. This is what the back stitching looks like. I hope you can see it. And while it's not as angled as a guy would like, it is pulled a little tighter, and that's why it's not so angled. If I didn't pull it as tight, it would have a little more angle to it. So I do think I am going to put, at least on the front side here, it's a little light. So I think I'm going to put another coat of, light of dye on it before I start burnishing. And then we'll go through the edge burnishing uh, with dye as opposed to using water. You can use dye or water or gum tragacanth, uh, token oil, whatever you want really. Um, and then we'll get some finish on it. Folded now. So it'll hold that shape real well now. And you can see it's just a little bunged up on, on the fold here. I'll just take care of that with a little sanding paper. First thing I grabbed was a 320. That should be just fine. <clears throat> I'm just going to take it, kind of curve it a little bit. It doesn't take much to just all, all I'm trying to do is smooth it out a little. And I'm just smoothing out in that area there. Now there's some wrinkles. Let's see if we can... Uh, there's some wrinkles that got in there. Right in that fold. So I'm going to try to kind of take some of those out. I'm going to grab some 220. And I'm going to back that with a piece of my uh, infamous coat hanger. Even when you break those plastic coat hangers, they still have a use. And the only reason it wrinkles there is because I leave this this part a little thicker. I've seen belts break here before where they're uh, hooked on there. I don't know if people pull them too tight or what they do. But I've seen them break. And uh, so I leave that thicker. When I skive these, I'm going to skive those too. I don't know if I actually showed you that uh, when I skive that too. 
zero that. Three and a half millimeters. And if I look at my handy dandy chart, that gets us to eight to nine ounce. So some belts are skived. I've seen them skived down to like a thickness of a four to five ounce. Probably right in that uh, two millimeter range at the most. It just seems a little thin to me. Um, the Tandy blanks I think are a little, they're quite a bit thinner than this. And I just, I just don't think that's good enough. I like a little thicker. And uh, because my belts last. Get the other side here. It doesn't take too much. Just get it kind of cleaned up a little bit. <clears throat> It'll reburnish it. A little bit of dye. A little bit of rubbing with some canvas. She'll be all burnished up again. Good as new. Then we'll put a top coat on it and I'll be back in a couple of minutes as soon as I get that burnished. Alrighty, I am back. I'm ready to put my top coat on. My top coat of choice for this belt is going to be tan coat. I just use a wool dauber to put it on. Works pretty good for me most of the time. It allows me to kind of get into the belt loops, the belt holes a little bit and all the way into the uh, grooves that we cut for the stitching. Uh, this will help protect the stitching and just kind of give a protective coat to everything on the belt. Water will go through tan coat as will oil and such like that. You can So you can oil your belt um, and you can snow seal it or make oil it or whatever you want to use on it. Um, I just I have a lot of customers that like to do their own treatments to their leather goods, and that's fine. So that's what I why I use tan coat. Um, my personal belt I used um, oh a Tandy product. Can't remember what it was called. Something Sheen. I don't know. Can't remember exactly. I'd quit using it after that because I didn't care for it. But with the tan coat, I'll just I usually will use two coats, and I just want to make sure that I'm going kind of across my stitch grooves and up and down, just so I can make sure I get it in there. So you don't have to go out and buy those daubers because you don't need them. Pretty simple to put on. And that's all I do is just wipe it on, wipe it off. If you want to get into your holes better, your belt holes better, you can use a paintbrush, um, a cotton swab, some kind of a stick, whatever. I will use just a cotton swab because it works pretty darn well. But I won't do that until after everything's dry. So I just uh, finished stripping out the end of a side of 6-7 that uh, I don't know, probably it wasn't going to get used for anything else and I just missed out on something somehow you probably can't see it there is here's the other half of that because I cut it off like a ding dong For it. You probably won't see it on camera anyway. But put 
these two back together. There's a smiley face in there. <laughs> I didn't catch that until I was already cut through it. Oh well, what do you do? I try to keep stuff like that because it usually doesn't, it takes dye funny. Alrighty, well, here it is. It's splotchy and ugly and all that kind of good stuff. This is stuff I think is going to take be taken care of if I use some resoline on it. I don't always like using resoline on belts because it doesn't breathe like tan coat does. Uh, I'm going to reach over here right now before I forget and kick my heat up a bit. Try to get it up to about 65, 7, or oh, up to about 70. It's about 65 in here. All this stuff should be fine operating at 65 degrees. It should work just fine. Uh, but I'm going to do the resoline. I get my resoline in quart bottles and I mix it about 60 40, about 40% 40 regular tap water, about 60% resoline. I just like to thin it out a little bit. It applies a little nicer. It leaves me a nice finish without being super duper shiny. Uh, resoline has a tendency, it can be really shiny. Um, you can use a lot of finishes on a belt. I typically use the tan coat because I like something that breathes. It can go, uh, oils and stuff can go through it. This, I have other projects like this in my shop that I just can't send out the door because this is what they look like. I've got another one uh, over here sitting over on my gun bench that I just threw over there. I got frustrated with it. Um, and my tip wound up short. It's wound up short and my stitch lines wound up going straight off. And it was I don't know how that happened. Probably it went straight off and or went fine and then the tip had to be shortened for some reason. I don't remember what happened to it. It's been a while. And there it sits and I haven't done anything with it. I'm probably gonna throw some finish on it. It's just about done is the problem with it. I just need to finish sewing it. Um, it's almost done. So it's it really stinks. It's just got those couple of spots on the tip where the stitch line goes off the end and the last belt hole is probably an inch and a half, two inches from the tip. So I'll put another one more hole in the end. I'll change the size of the belt a little bit. It'll be fine. It's still a usable belt. I'll sell it as a second at a reduced price and out the door it goes. It's still a good quality belt. It just looks a little funky. It's still a perfectly serviceable belt. Made just like the rest of my belts. Just has a mistake on it. And that happens from time to time. There's no sense in throwing something like that away. You could give it a give it to somebody as a gift, say, hey, here's a here's a belt that I made. I screwed up a little bit on it. It still is just fine belt. If you can live with that flaw, here you go, it's yours. And there's nothing wrong with that. I do it all the time. Because I'd rather see somebody get some use out of it and enjoy it than see it go to waste. So one of these days, I've got a box full of stuff like that sitting over here on the shelf, and I'll get that stuff out. But this one, I don't want that to happen to this either, because we're so close to being done with it, and there's nothing wrong with it except the finish. Other than that, the belt's done. I did the other side. Still got some splotchy spots. I know why it is on the back side. It's because of that leather that I used. I never should have got done that, but like I said, it's a stock belt. But it's not a super shiny finish. Like I said, it's kind of a, a little duller. I probably put um, three coats on there. And I haven't buffed it out or anything yet. Eh. Oh wait, I'll take out a clean rag when it comes to buffing. I'll buff both sides. So now let's do this side. This is the good side. I just uh, cut up a t-shirt. <laughs> it's an old t-shirt. That's all she takes. Um, it'll soak up the resoline really well. All you got to do is just kind of wipe it on, 
Once you add the water to it, it dries a little faster that way. And I always put my first coat is always a little thicker, a little heavy on it. But you gotta watch it when it starts to dry. You gotta let it sit. Because it's really easy to get it streaky then. Now I did buff it out. And you can see that some of the black came out. It's gonna do that. It's okay. It's fine. Relax. Don't worry about it. Give this a couple of minutes. Wipe another coat on. But you can see it's starting to come around already. Some of that splotchiness will be leaving. You'll see after after the second coat here. I'll put three coats on it and then I'll come back and show you. One thing that people do get concerned about with a belt like this is dye transfer. Transferring black dye to your beautiful clothing. So I already buffed to the this side and nothing transferred to my cloth. That's why I used a white one. Um, these are just off of Amazon. So, <laughs> pretty simple. Um, and I just kind of buffed her out. So that was the front. I already did that once. The back hasn't been done yet. nothing. The resolene will seal it up pretty good and that's not an issue. So there we go. All we got left, um, I'm not going to token all the edges. I'm just gonna buff them out. The edges are the first thing to dull when you st when somebody starts wearing a belt. What do you think? Should we finish it up? I say yes. The easiest way to get this to lay straight is I go through this way. I hold my tongue, the tongue of the belt buckle. Let's not lose our screws now. I just hold it up a little bit. Put it see if I can do it sideways. Just stick it through here like this. With the top up, there's a little divot in this buckle here. So you know where the tongue goes. And I just run it through. The tongue goes out the slot that we made in it. And there's your buckle. Simple. Why complicate things? And I don't have, I need to find some of these gunmetal Chicago screws. I haven't been able to find any. So I'm using flat black on these, or matte black. And those are the same. I could go with, I suppose, a nickel. But then that's kind of bright, isn't it? Let's stick with the black. Stick with the black. Go with your gut. And I'll just stick that through there the first hole. And of course it doesn't want to fit through the other hole. Because 
I went through this way so it's smaller on the back side. To fix that, just grab something that has a nice taper on it. Just poke her through there a little bit. Should give me a taper on the inside. Maybe a little more taper than that. Just so you can get it in there. No, you don't want to tighten that up yet because we got to get our keeper on. This is the back of the belt. I want my staple to go in between here. So I'm going to have my staple up. This is the tab. I'm just going to go right from the other end of the belt slider right in between there and right away I know I'm gonna have to increase this hole a little bit so we'll do that right away I'm just feed that through from this side screwdriver somehow they hit the floor while I was cleaning out my toolbox the other day a trick to not wrecking a screw is to use the thickest blades that you can and See if I can get this to focus on that. You can see how that curves, this curve here. That's what they call a hollow ground screwdriver bit. And those are the best kind because it gives you more biting surface on the edge of the screw. Hmm. Slots on these are kind of thin. I was hoping that one would work. I didn't want to grab such a small bit. something as long as the slot is usually and I just hold my finger and my thumb on the back of the screw tighten her down good I can count on one finger how many of these screws I've had come loose since I started making belts on one finger there could be more but I don't know about them so there's our keeper. It comes around and the belt fits right through it just like that. So we run our belt through there and through the keeper. We wind up with a really nice looking belt. Well there we go. That's the first of four belts I think we're gonna make. And the rest of them, I'm going to make much shorter videos. Uh, this one, I think, is going to, probably going to wind up being two parts. You'll know when, the, when you see this how many parts it is. Um, I think it came out great. I like the new tip. I like that a lot. I might go to that permanently. You never know. You don't know. Um, I like six holes. I do like the oblong holes, although the round hole worked out pretty good on this one. Just used a little bit bigger hole than I would normally use when I use a round hole on a belt. So there is that. When you uh, are measuring your belt, I'll try to leave this somewhere, um, or at least leave a link to this diagram or a similar diagram. Just about every Oh, I can't say that. I'll find it, or one similar, from
from your turn back, this part here, or on this belt, right here, where the buckle attaches, to the hole, the center hole. They usually say, and by they I mean people that do this all the time, say so your waist size plus two inches. Personally, I say your waist size plus one inch, and I add, and add two inches if it's going to be a for inside the waistband carry. That's what I did on my personal belt, and it works out great. I do carry inside the waistband, so and it worked out really well for me. So that is where I would say to go. In my opinion, everybody's got to experiment a little bit. My belts, I think, speak for themselves. The quality is there. The construction is there. I showed you how to take care of that little issue with the finish on it. The tan coat just didn't finish up. But uh, the Resoline came through for me. And now it's sealed. Good thing we oiled it. Um, so I will try to leave a link to this diagram. My note here is waist size plus 11 inches is your tip to tip measurement for your blank or your billet or whatever you want to call it. I call it a blank. That's my length for so if I need a 36 inch waist or 36 inch belt I will have a 47 inch blank and that's how I measure it. So that's kind of a and maybe I'll just make a new one and put it up on my driver Google up in the cloud somewhere for you. This chart, this is I like this one better than most of them I've seen. Um, but it gives you your weight, your thickness of leather in millimeters, your thickness in inch imperial measurements, fractional, and then uh, your ounces. So I'll try to leave links to these or similar somehow. I'll try to get them there for you. That being said, I will uh, catch you in the next video.